Welcome back to Second Breakfast. It is 105 degrees out here in Texas, so to escape <laughs> that, Maggie and I are fleeing to the wall to discuss today's Game of Thrones chapter, <laughs> John number four. You know, what we could have done instead is poured ourselves a nice glass of sweetened milk like we did last week, <laughs> but instead we went to the wall. I think that was the better choice. I love that that's haunting you. I think about it daily, and it <laughs> is deeply upsetting, and I'm so revolted by it. So what anyway, happened in this chapter? A lot happened in this chapter. Not a lot. I mean, some. Not a lot compared to what's happening in the Fire and Blood chapters. By the way, we're reading Fire and Blood over on our Patreon. You can join for $2 a month and get access to currently weekly bonus episodes. Where Every We're going Sunday. through all of the Fire and Blood chapters that are relevant to the House of the Dragon series on HBO. So if you want more Song of Ice and Fire, George R. R. Martin, that's all over there. Also, Dollars to Donuts, the chapter we did this past Sunday uh-huh. is season three. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. So anyway, go go check that out. It's fun. But no, this is much simpler. But still, it's it's full of meaning, as all of these chapters are. So let's Great dive in. plug, by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's like I've been doing this for four years. Okay, so <laughs> this is John number four. Quick reminder, we're going to spoil everything. Okay, so John is teaching his fellow Night's Watch brothers how to fight out in the yard. He's like sort of really falling. He's really uh, grounded into that role. Okay. And then a new brother has arrived. And this is our one of our favorite characters ever, Samuel Tarley. So this kid arrives. He is, I'm going to quote George R. R. Martin, he is the fattest boy that John has ever seen. He said he's probably about 20 stone, which I looked it up. That's about 280 pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like, what is a stone? What is that? Anyway, so that he, he's a big guy, right? But, call them stones. But he's also very, like, you can tell he's very nervous. He's got, like, sweaty palms. Like, he clearly does not belong. He's weak. Stop. Palms are sweaty. <laughs> Mom's spaghetti. <laughs> It's Eminem. <laughs> this just turns into Eight Mile. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so so Eminem has arrived on the scene, and um, everybody's immediately That's like, mean. "It is mean." Everybody that sounds like you mean the other Eminem. What the Eminem? The like candy. the candy? Yes. <laughs> no, not not the Eminem candy. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Eminems. <laughs> what if they had spaghetti flavored Eminems? Can you imagine? They call it. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. We're off track. It's okay. Those Oreos we saw the other day. What Oreos? The ones with like gummy worms in them? No, it was Sour Patch. Oh. It was Sour Patch Kids Oreos. It, I'm sorry. I'm so distracted. <laughs> you guys want some iced honey milk? Okay. So they, they start, everyone's ganging up on Sam. It's very uh-huh. mean. And Alistair Thorne, our favorite baddie, he has all of the boys, he has one of the boys uh, fight Sam and he chooses Halder, who's like this big guy, very strong. And um, Sam, poor guy, he can't fight back at all. He like immediately is knocked down keeps getting hit says that he yields but Alistair keeps pushing Halder to beat him up and finally John steps in and says hey stop like he yielded there's no honor in just beating up this kid Alistair is of course not happy about this and so he as punishment sets three boys onto John and he's like okay fine they can get through you to get to Sam and then John's friends Pip and Gren join him and they basically have a three-on-three fight and um, John's crew of course wins and so Alistair is like, mm, fine. And he walks away. Um, so we learn that the boy is, of course, Samuel Tarley of Horn Hill. And they all ask, like, hey, like, why didn't you fight back? Like, you, you totally could have tried. And Sam just says, I fear I'm a coward. Like, this guy has no self-confidence. He's got a really shattered view of himself. It's pretty sad. Um, and so John is later sort of contemplating that and thinks that it takes, quote, a queer sort of courage to admit to cowardice. So he was kind of contemplating that. That night at dinner, John finds Sam eating alone, and he says, why don't we go outside, like away from the crowd, basically. So he and uh, Sam and Ghost go for a walk outside. And John asks Sam why Coward would want to join the Night's Watch, because Sam seems joined voluntarily. And then Sam just breaks down and starts crying, and John doesn't know what to do. But then, of course, Ghost goes and licks Sam's tears, and Sam kind of laughs, and it breaks that tension. And then we learn Sam's story. So Sam is the eldest son of Lord Randall Tarley, who was the who was a bannerman to Mace Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden and Warden of the South. So Sam's n- certainly highborn, but he's not quite as high in station as like John would have been if he were trueborn. But he's still pretty up there. So we're like, hmm, why is he down here or up here? <laughs> um, we learned that growing up, Sam was just never the kind of boy his father wanted him to be. He was not traditionally masculine. He liked to sing and eat and like read. And dance. And, and dance. Yeah, like sweet, sweet kid. And his dad was not happy about it. Eventually, um, Sam's mother gives birth to another another boy. And so on Sam's 15th name day, his father tells him he's going to name the younger son Dickon his heir. And Sam's going to have to basically decide to take the black kind of like when you ask somebody to resign but you're firing them it's that kind of thing um and he says you're either going to take the black 
or I'm literally going to hunt you down and kill you in the woods. Like so, there's going to be an accident during a hunt. Right. But yeah. like his father is going to hunt him like the pig he is. That's what he says. So Sam says, okay, I will take the black. <laughs> and that's how he has ended up here. Um, and John like hears that story and then doesn't really know what to say, but he takes him back inside and Sam's like, you know what? I'm probably going to have to fight again tomorrow. I'm going to go to bed. And so the other boys then go up to John. They're like, hey, like, what's the deal with him? And they're making fun of Sam. And John just says, absolutely not. And he gets them all in line. And like from that day on, nobody fights or hurts Sam, despite what Alistair Thorne like says when they say, when he says like fight back, they like tap him with their swords. Like they, they don't hurt him anymore. The one guy who dissents is a guy named Rast who's a nasty guy and to sort of get him in line john and pip and gren all like break into his room at night and they bring ghost and basically threaten him they're like we know where you sleep <laughs> and so then it's never a problem again so after about two weeks sam is really starting to feel like one of them he's joined their table at meals and john says that they're more than friends they're brothers and that's where we end this chapter got me i i, mm. I know i'm a sucker <laughs> for this kind of thing but i got kind of choked up at the end because when Sam visits him and says, like, I don't know what you did, but I know you did something. Yeah. He then says, I've never had a friend before. Yeah. And yeah. that's when John says, mm-hmm. we're, we're not more friends, than friends. We're brothers. Yeah. Oh, oh. It's just beautiful. It is beautiful. I love this character. I love this friendship. I I'm, I didn't realize that Sam came on so early in the story. And mm-hmm. I was really excited to see him. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, can, maybe we should start with the friendship thing. Okay. Yeah. Is, sure. that, is that okay? Sure. Because one thing I was really picking up on... And you kind of pointed this out to me too, and I've thought about this before, are some Lord of the Rings crossovers here. We've talked about George R. R. Martin crossing over and reminiscing on and reflecting on and playing with stuff that Tolkien did, because Tolkien's the OG in this in this genre. And Why else did he give himself world. the double middle names? Right. R.R. <laughs> why, mm, why would you do I mean, that? He talks about that all the time. He's a bigger Tolkien nerd than we are. Right. Yeah. So you're always looking for that. And I think we've drawn like some actual like fellowship comparisons before, like different groups of people being like a fellowship. But this one is fun because I think we can think of this group of four of John, Sam, Pip and Gren as sort of mirroring uh, Frodo, Sam, Pippin and Mary, the hobbits in the Lord of the Rings uh, fellowship. So of course, the easiest comparison there is Sam is Sam, <laughs> Sam well and Sam wise. They're both like the like sort of blundering loyal uh, right hand guy to the to the number one hobbit or hero in this story. Right. So that makes sense. Sam is Sam. The yellow m M&M. m to the red M&M <laughs> That's right. of their protagonist. That's right. So the red M&M here is John, also known as Frodo. Um, interestingly, both of them have um, special uncles who disappear. Bilbo, of course, disappears um, at the beginning of the Fellowship story. And Uncle Benjen is still mysteriously gone and has se- seems to have disappeared in this story, too. Um, and then the easy comparison next is Pip equals Pippin. Like, duh. And then Gren is the other one, Mary. Now, of course, it's not a one-to-one, and that doesn't really, that's not necessarily the point, but there's so many similarities with the, not only the naming, but the mannerisms and the way that these four interact together, that that comparison just has to be there. The other thing is that I know that eventually in the story, Sam and John are going to be kind of off on their own while Gren and Pip are not with them, the way that Merry and Pippin break away from Sam and Frodo and Lord of the Rings. So that comparison is there too. There are a couple, like, it's funny because while you were saying that, I was thinking even phonetically, it's like you change Merry to almost grim. Sure. They both got double letters in their names. It's also that Pip is short for Peregrine, Gren. Oh, oh, sure. Like yeah, there's, there's, there are, it's close enough. Yeah, there's shout some, out Peregrine. Yeah, shout, shout out Peregrine. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's something there. So you know, and it's of course in this world, it's sort of the bastardized version. Like, but the, the, it's not like a beautiful, uh, you know, pure, you know, cinnamon roll group of boys who love each other <laughs> unconditionally. Like it's it's messed up. It's these guys who have been thrown together the Night's Watch. They're bastards and thieves and all kinds of things. So it's not the same wholesome version, but it, it's still there. Um, and but they're both serving like the same function right it's like these group of four boys with one thing in common it's either they're all hobbits or in this case they're all outcasts at the night's watch and they become close friends slash brothers through like collective trauma and difficult experiences like that's what really brings them together is their shared traumatic experience um and so i was thinking about that i was like okay why invite that comparison like it's fun to notice that like okay cool but like, then what? What do you do with that? Why Why invite your reader to notice that? Because it's pretty clearly there. Um, I think part of it is that it could speak to just 
a universal truth about friendship in the face of adversity. Like people are brought together through difficult things that they share. And so that's, that's fun. And that's there. Um, but of course he's also just, we know that George R. R. Martin likes to play with fantasy tropes. Um, and, and that I think in and of itself, that group of four is a fantasy trope, the, like group of guys who come together and form this like unbreakable bond of friendship. Um, no girls yeah allowed. no girls allowed yeah it's definitely it's definitely fully platonic yeah. there's no romantic feelings between any of them except for sam and frodo but whatever um but and but you know and here george is really grounding it in like the grim reality that he likes to ground his stories in um and it just plays with your expectations like if you know like if you recognize that comparison off the bat which is pretty clear that you can like once sam comes into the picture you're like oh, I get it, because you got Pip, and you got, like, our main guy, and a Sam. Oh, yeah, Gren can be married, boom, done. Then it makes you wonder what's going to happen next. And George likes to, you know, subvert expectations, flip things, and go directions that you don't expect. So I think it'll be fun to sort of see where he diverges from right, the, right. the Hobbit, you know, quad uh, quad group, mm-hmm. right, the, the, the four of them. But you have to set up the trope to then divert from it so i think this is sort of the t-ball of you have the core four fellowship Mm -hmm. and then you diverge from it because this is such this isn't just one ensemble it's about 30 Mm. so you know with the fullness of time and story in the show that sam will eventually have his own ensemble and go off on his own journey this isn't one clean fellowship that is going to move through the whole story together right they're all going to diverge but i think this moment of fellowship really matters i agree um it is oh i'm sorry no no i was just going to bounce off that that one line you said about adversity in the face of hardship yeah because that's what really spoke to me here uh my takeaway from sam's introduction and this bond that is formed at the wall is hope Hmm. and giving people second chances and that I think that's a huge part of hope, especially interpersonally. Yeah. There's grace, there's forgiveness. Those are all tied into hope. And I think th- Sam represents the answer to the problem that we keep talking about week to week. The problem on the horizon, the White Walker threat. Yeah, yeah. And I think the answer to that problem is Sam. Mm. I think he, he represents a lot of things. You're, you're introduced to this idea in microcosm before Sam's even on the scene with... Just seeing how John is now interacting with Pip and Gren. Remember yeah. like a chapter or two ago when they <laughs> were trying to kill him in the armory? Right. He's really settled in. Yeah. Right. But also they've given each other second chances. Mm, yeah. There is hope already demonstrated here. It's not like Sam is this beacon new idea. I would say Sam, when he's introduced, is more of a distillation echo mm. where he's heightening and repeating those ideas that were seen quietly introduced between John and Pip and Gren. Sam is someone to help. He's an ally. He's an asset. We know eventually he will be a hero in his own right. But in this moment, he's just something concrete, hmm. as opposed to the rumors of White Walkers, the rumors of the others in the woods when you go out ranging, as opposed to the immaterial threats that we see bogging down all these other pov characters the geopolitics you can't really put a face to that the master of whispers that's like tormenting ned (laughs) with all of these spiders and snakes he keeps getting introduced to they're not concrete right Mm -hmm. they're not problems you can wrap your hands around sam sort of is i mean we spent all of last week talking about ned floundering drowning in king's landing we called it this world of liars and crooks Back to the distillation echo thing. The wall is literally a world of liars and crooks. (laughs) True, So it's interesting to juxtapose the wall as almost an honestly dishonest version of King's Landing. Right. Well, and that contrast is heightened also by the the position that our POV characters are in in these respective places. Yeah. Last chapter was all about how Ned is totally, he's like lost the game already. He's not at all doing well in his new home, whereas John is thriving yeah like he's not having a nice time but he's settling in and he feels like he belongs there and like he's accepted this is my home and he has a position of power there even as an unsworn 
you know, novice, basically. Right. And Ned is mostly floundering because he's alone in King's Landing. Even though he has, like, the second highest position in the entire Seven Kingdoms. Right. And that doesn't matter if you don't have allies. Mm -hmm. And all we see John doing here and why we say he's winning is that he's assembling allies. Yeah. Sam is more explicit than Pip and Gren. They sort of just fall in line. But Sam is, like, the first official link in a chain. Yeah. He's the foothold that will get John out of this Viper pit. By the end of the chapter, he has at least three allies and i don't think it's a coincidence obviously that even john makes the explicit comparison between sam and Tyrion. yeah i think he's learning on the fly he's adapting in the face of adversity to try to build this vanguard Mm. and recognize the value in the people around him to give them second chances to inspire hope in them yeah because even though Tyrion is no longer here Tyrion's like kindness and friendship that he formed with john was essential to John, like, adapting to where he is at the wall now. He would not have fallen into the place that he's in at the wall without Tyrion's advice sure. and, and kindness. So he's trying to do the same thing with Sam. I mean, even when he, like, takes him outside during dinner, that reminded me of the first John chapter when Tyrion and John meet and they're standing outside the Great Hall of Winterfell. like Forming was... a bond of kinship in front of mm. the largest explicit metaphor for the White Walker threat. <laughs> we talked about the wall being a big White Walker. Yes. It, it's, it's, ex- it's exactly where I was going to go with right. this. Because John... John even says, like, have you seen the wall? All. like yes. they go to talk about it and like like the threat is there and that's where john recounts his dream oh, of yeah. winterfell being empty and everyone being gone mm-hmm. you and i know the rules of the magic system we know how this game is played the doomsday scenario is that everyone's gone because when white walkers kill people they then stand up again and turn into white walkers right, so all the dead are gone too. that's how i understood that dream but I, I think the other thing to settle on here i love that you said john is winning where ned is losing because i didn't look at it that way but that's mm. That I think that's a perfect contrast here. I want to I wanna zoom in a little bit. Sam is not just a beacon of hope because he's naive and mm. pure and virtuous. Right, he's like he not. has a childlike view because he's not, he's he's not. not stupid. He's no. smart, yeah. Exactly, and th- that's, I think, why it's important that they do the little oranges, the new black thing where they swap their <laughs> origin stories. Why are you in prison? Why are you in prison? Yes, right. I'm glad they do that here. Because mm-hmm. we're immediately clarifying that Sam is not inspirational and good because he's pure and virtuous and the undriven snow. It's not that. Mm. Sam has survived absolute horror. Mm-hmm. And if you want to pull it back to Sepkowski, more than his fair share of the problem of evil <laughs> sure. at his father's hand. Yeah. And the thing that makes him an asset, that makes him heroic, that makes John entrust his future in Sam, is that Sam survived the problem of evil without himself turning evil. Yeah. Like Tyrion, he's gone through a whole ration of shit. He's tested and proven. Mm. And it, neither of these guys are your traditional heroes or knights, no. but they are battle-tested in a way that that isn't immediately visible. And mm. I think John's skill is the perception to see past that first impression. Yeah, that's always his skill is that yeah. he has that, that watchfulness, that observation, those powers of perception. Because yeah. John is not a fairy tale leader either. He's Mm-mm. not he's not Aragorn as much as I want him to be. <laughs> no. At the end when he's threatening Rast, he's threatening to kill a guy to protect another guy. Yeah. But I think that's back to the the overall lesson of George R. R. Martin, him t-balling Lord of the Rings and then pivoting to his own version of this fantasy world. His heroes, if you can call them that, are not ideal. Mm -mm. They don't have the plot armor. They don't have necessarily the unbroken virtue. They're just fighters Mm. who have a just cause. Mm -hmm. And I think John is the closest thing we're going to get to a knight in this world. Shout out, Tristan. (laughs) I just love John so much. And I think the relationship with Sam locks that down for me and i also think that the the contrast that sam provides i think helps john become more well-rounded and stronger because all around him he's like i think i feel like when john arrives at the wall he's surrounded by the mentality of you have to harden yourself you have to push you have to just like be strong and do your job and like and strength you know build up your strengths and just like be a good you know member of the night's watch but there's no camaraderie between the group like that whole idea of you know brotherhood is really not there when john arrives like there's all this animosity between everybody not just against john but like some people are bonding i guess through their shared hatred and bullying of other people but there's really not a sense of camaraderie and like 
team <laughs> in this uh, in this group. And so I think that the introduction of Sam helps to build out that the that feeling of brothership among these people, and it brings people together so that they're not they not only become strong and good fighters and hardened against the winter and hardened against tough and scary things, but also that they'll support each other and protect each other and will go the extra mile to help each other. It's like essential for this group to be successful. So I I think that makes total sense. Yeah, I have a totally different direction of popcorn in unless you have anything else here. Well, you mentioned the dream and I have stuff about the dream. Oh, okay, cool. So if that's that's That is more your territory. (laughs) I didn't mention this dream in the recap, but basically before Sam tells his story, John talks about this dream. So yeah, it's this dream where he's he, he's saying, talking about how he misses Winterfell he misses home and how like in this dream he's wandering through the walls you know, the halls of Winterfell but nobody's there and it's just like totally empty even all the ravens are gone like the stables are full of bones there's nobody there and he's like calling out and trying to find his family and they're not there and then he ends up like running up this tower and then he opens the door and it's actually the door down to the crypt and he like goes down to the crypt and it gets dark and he's terrified and he wakes up like that's the dream So, of course, I had a ball with this. And I think, like, the simplest explanation, sort of what you hinted at, is his old life is gone. It can never be the way it was. Like, his family is gone. He can't, if he goes back to Winterfell, it won't be the same. Like, he can't have his old life back. It also hints at the larger thing, which you hinted at, of the winter that is coming, the White Walkers that are coming, and that will wipe everybody out. That stuff is there, too. But I also wanted to kind of dive into it just a little bit deeper. Um, One thing that stuck out to me was when he's looking for his family members and none of them are there. The ones he names are, he's, he says, like, I don't know who I'm looking for. Sometimes it's this person, this person. So the people he names are Ned, Rob, Arya, and Benjen. All four of those characters effectively die. Ned and Rob both actually die. Benjen either disappears or dies or both. I can't truly remember, but he doesn't come back normally. <laughs> and Arya disappears and literally loses her identity. So I thought it was interesting that he named those people. Like, he didn't name uh Bran which I thought was interesting like Bran's the other person that he has an actual close relationship with so why wasn't he looking for Bran because Bran is alive I guess so that was interesting just like in the dream Bran is not gone but these other people do end up being gone in some way um and then of course like uh the, the, the other important part of the dream is when he goes into the crypt or when he is opening the door into the crypt uh one of the things he says is somehow I know I have to go down there knowing and i think we can interpret that as john is going to in fact die like he'll have to effectively go down into a crypt when he is killed later so that's fun um the other thing is that he in the dream he says i scream that i'm not a stark that this isn't my place we know that john is not a stark not only is he's not a trueborn stark because he's a bastard but it's really that he's a targaryen and he doesn't belong in winterfell this is not his place um and so i think that is interesting there um and he says but it's no good i have to go anyway and like as in go down into this crypt that is not his place and so i think that might hint at the end of our story when he has to go back to winterfell anyway even though he's not a stark um or also that he's going to have to continue to live his life throughout the re- most of the rest of this story thinking that he is the father of ned like not under- understanding that he's a targaryen so like, he has to like go through that lie about himself anyway i think that's part of it and um the other thing that i thought was interesting was uh it says the old kings of winter are down there in the crypt but it's it's not but it's not them i'm afraid of but he doesn't answer what he is then afraid of like if he's not afraid of like the ghosts of winterfell of the dead if he's not afraid of the dead what is he afraid of i don't think he knows what he's afraid of because he doesn't know the white walkers are real or out there Mm. but he's near it he's the closest one to them because Mm. he's on the wall because he's hearing the legends but i don't think he has a clear view of the enemy yet he just has the hair on the back of his neck standing up he has that sort of animalistic awareness of the problem without being able to point at it and name it yeah i I think that could be part of it because the other thing is that when he says it's not them i'm afraid of the next thing he's talking about is when he says um i I scream that i'm not a stark that this isn't my place so i wonder if what he is afraid of is the truth of who he actually is like when he finds out he's a targaryen he really reject at least in this in the show i don't know what's gonna be like in the books but he rejects that truth he rejects like that he could be the heir to the iron throne like he totally rejects that and is afraid of that reality so i wonder if that's maybe part of it too is that he's just 
that's great. Fears this yeah. truth. I think that now that you say it, that feels much more natural. Mm. Um, the the other thing that's interesting is that Bran isn't mentioned. Mm-hmm. You pointed that out. I view Bran as sort of the master of dreams. I think eventually mm-hmm. he'll hold that position. Certainly. The second he started having this ridiculously poignant dream, I was thinking, did Bran somehow like implant this in him? <laughs> it just felt mm. too curated. Yeah. And if there's going to be any character who's able to curate dreams for other people... I feel like it's Bran. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Just an idea. But then why would he not include himself? I don't know. Maybe to not give it away. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe just like a warning telling John not to come back. I just sensed Bran during that dream. Well, then I wonder about the, in the previous chapter with Ned, we learned that Sansa had that dream where Bran was smiling. So maybe Bran wants, I don't think Bran's trying to give them an impression that he's okay. Uh, Because remember, we interpreted that dream as another falsity that takes place at King's Landing. Everything is wrong and and a lie in King's Landing. So I don't know if Bran really has a hand in that dream. Just a hunch. Yeah, but something to track and and, and think about as we go forward. Anytime somebody has a dream, think about it. (laughs) Oh, sure. And I think Bran is always in that conversation. Yeah. Another hunch I had a couple weeks ago, I feel like I can now tie into a bow. I think it was the last Danny chapter. We were talking about this sort of Faust, like half of Faustus framing that yes. isn't quite perfect. Yes. And I, I want to return to that a little bit. I was I was spitballing this idea about the wolves and dragons, mm. and I was positioning them as demons in the Faustus framework, but demons who are not consciously summoned, right? But nevertheless, offer the world to their non-summoner counterparts. Mm-hmm. John has ghosts. Danny has the dragons. The right. other star kids have their dire wolves. Right. And I was reminded of that again here, and I think I made some more progress with it because throughout this chapter, John is accompanied by, protected by ghost. Mm-hmm. And without that dire wolf doing his little chores with him, John's screwed, right? There's a limit <laughs> yeah. to how much people are going to screw with him because he has this wolf. So he's a, he's a continued asset in John's overall arc. And I can't imagine how much worse off he'd be without him. Oh, yeah. And this is where another puzzle sort of, another piece sort of fell into the puzzle here as I noticed the big deviation from the Faustus framework. We talked about that Mm. T-ball thing earlier. If these are demons who are not summoned, then the traditional summoner character, Faustus, who, who would be damned for summoning a demon, right? if he doesn't summon the demon then he's also not damned. <laughs> and we don't see a punishment that happens for the people with dire wolves after they lose their dire wolves or Danny after she loses her dragons. Like, yes, some of those characters happen to die after they lose their demon <laughs> allegorical characters, but I don't think it's that clean that sure. they are like punished or they have to pay the price for having this demon i think danny does kind of fit that though like she's killed because she's gone too far with her demons her but dragons, it's, right it's that it's she's used them too much <laughs> it's unconscious though yeah it's different in the faustus framework because the catch is the ambiguity here mm. without an explicit contract without an explicit trade the character saying i will give up my soul for this demon companion mm. Without a contract, without a trade, there are no terms. In the play, Faustus knows he has 24 years of Mephistopheles' service. Mm -hmm. Tries to beg for more at the end, doesn't work, (laughs) gets dragged down to hell, gets the punishment after the terms. You know, the deal is complete and it goes through. But here, as we've already seen, the wolves can leave their Mm non-summoners. They can die at any time. And so that person loses that advantage. Yeah, they're not bound to them through through a contract, yeah. But they're not damned because they didn't trade their soul. Mm -hmm. They're not damned, they're not responsible because they didn't sign a contract or try to summon these things. Mm. And I, I, I enjoy how a la carte that is. I think this is the deviation from the Faustus framework. Because they're unsummoned demons, because they can leave or die at any time, the characters who have this enormous power of a direwolf or a dragon, it's always precarious because you never know when they're going to lose that power. They don't have the security of a 24-year contract. Mm. You can see Rob Stark's dead direwolf head, you know, staked through his body at the end of the Red Wedding. Mm. It didn't protect him. It didn't save him. <laughs> There's no cleanliness. There's no exchange here. Yeah. To, to, to frame this through, and I think this is how you nerf it from keeping these characters who are endowed with demon substitute companions from being permanently overpowered 
I think that ambiguity and that uh, the precarious nature of that relationship keeps them from being plot armored through the entire story. Mm. The metaphor would be Faustus signed a lease. The <laughs> Game of Thrones characters are month to month. <laughs> but they don't know okay. when they're going to be evicted. Interesting. They're yeah. flying without a parachute. Mm. They're driving a car that doesn't have a fuel gauge. Mm. Those are the metaphors. And I think that difference is what balances out the story. Hmm. Because on paper, if you have a character in a fantasy book and you give them a dragon, they're going to win. Right. You give them a big ass wolf and they're 12 years old, they're going to be fine. And I think this is the flying without a parachute element that George kind of flips the framework on its head to keep the story interesting, to maintain the dramatic stakes. I see, yeah. No, I, I like that. I think that works really well. And to, to strengthen your point about both the dragons and the dire wolves sort of filling the same demon role, uh, there was a great moment where a ghost is being described and it says, the dire wolf's eyes burned red as embers. That felt so dragon-coated to me. <laughs> and I think ghost, more than any of the other dire wolves, is really the most dragon-ish, which cer certainly strengthens John's Targaryen lineage. So I thought that was really fun. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, if when Danny has three dragons towards the end of the books, that's a bigger advantage than having one big dog. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, it's it's so relative, right? Because mm -hmm. the dragons fit her storyline. They sort of blossom with her as she goes on this big, long arc. But I think the dire wolves, it's kind of like, hold with me here. It's kind of <laughs> like in Mario Kart. <laughs> okay. When you have characters like Bowser or Waluigi, any mm -hmm. of the big boys who have terrible acceleration in their carts, but mm. they have higher speeds. Yes. So if you can keep it going, they'll win in the long run <laughs> versus the tiny characters, Baby Mario, right. you know, those guys who have great acceleration and terrible top speed. Yes, right. I think the Starks needed the big-ass dire wolf to protect them early on, mm. and Danny needed the big-ass dragons later on. Sure. <laughs> I like that. Well, also, if you want to go back to the thing about allies and building up allies and that being essential to success, Danny, except for Jorah, kind of... Not that she doesn't have allies throughout her story, but they keep getting killed off. They keep betraying her. Like even Jorah be has betrayed her, right? Like they keep, they're keeping problems with her allies. And so like really the only ones she can solidly rely on are the dragons versus John, who has Sam and Pip and Grant and other Night's Watch brothers. And then later Ygritte and the Wildlings. So it's, it's a little bit different. Well, the other way of viewing it is that Danny is just more competent on her own. And I think she is infinitely more capable than the Stark children are at the beginning of their journey. That's true. John needs a lot of help from a lot of people. Right. Even he though they're the like ensemble. the same age. <laughs> he yeah. grows to be confident. All of the Stark kids do. Mm. Danny starts as the competent, smart survivor. Because she's on her own from the beginning. That's what I'm in saying. In a way that none of the others are. Yeah, exactly. So it's interesting that their, their sort of demon companions are catered <laughs> to what they need to be yeah. at the right time. I like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I think that sort of puts a pin in the Faustus thing for me, but sure. now I do have a better sense of it. This lack of a contract meaning lack of terms, mm. and that is a lack of security. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Cool. This, this was, was John fun. number four. Yeah. Next week, we'll be going to... Right back to Ned, which Ooh. is cool, because we just had him last week, so Rest now we're right peace. back to him. So, yep. Not... He's got to have one more conversation with Cersei, and then we throw him <laughs> in the dungeon. Yeah, I can't remember what, what exactly happens in this next one, but it'll, <laughs> it'll be fun. So yeah, we'll be back with Ned next week. Let us know what you thought of this John chapter, of any of the stuff we discussed, anything that we totally left out, anything that we're totally wrong about. Oh, yeah, sure. Other things you want to share. If you're on YouTube, comment below. Same with Patreon. Or if you're uh, just listening on a podcast, you can email us, secondbreakfastpod at gmail.com. You can also DM us on Instagram at secondbreakfastpod. We already plugged with the Patreon. Just a quick reminder, programming note, uh, we're not doing Summerween this year because usually we do like a big horror series throughout the summer. Instead, because House of the Dragon is coming back, our Curveball Tuesdays are going to be House of the Dragon coverage. We're going to do episode oh, yeah. by episode discussions as those episodes come out every week. It's going to be really fun. Um, but don't worry, horror is coming back just later we're gonna do a whole spooky season uh september october horror series so horror stuff is coming just not yet we're gonna prioritize house of the dragon yes fire fire and blood episodes every sunday on patreon also we just did two uh two episodes on furiosa oh yeah this, earlier this week so yeah. check all that out join us on patreon as we continue this death march through fire and blood we're getting to the end now and mm -hmm. it is 
Oh boy. It's exciting. Oh boy. Big it's stuff. Stressful. It's a classic. <laughs> the heights of Game of Thrones were now hitting those sort of crescendos oh, in man. this story. It's so, so exciting. That's scary and exciting and overwhelming. Mm-hmm. I mean, the episode we did this last Friday was like an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, there's, there's so there's much happened in that there. chapter. Like, yeah. it's so funny because these Game of Thrones chapters, like we said, they're like, you know, between five and 12 pages. The House of the Dragon chapters are like 50 pages. And it's just a lot is happening, especially because it's not a slowed down narrative. It's a history. So anyway, check those out. They're fun. Um, all right. Well, go pour yourself a glass of sweetened iced milk. And, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> See right. you next week. Bye.